Greetings, everybody. Um, last week, we finished up with Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. So that's where we're picking up. We still have some of chapter 20 to go. And that's all I plan to get through is the rest of chapter 20. So by way of review, and as promised, we're going to start with that verse again, Revelation 20, verse 10. Um, and then that's by way of introduction, then we'll open in prayer and begin today's lesson. So Revelation 20, 10 says the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and that's where we ended last week with the final judgment of the enemy um, and those are the first three characters actually who occupy the lake of fire are the beast the false prophet uh, the antichrist um, so the false prophet the Antichrist and Satan, the the unholy trio or trinity. And then after that comes what we're going to read about today, and that is the great white throne judgment. And that's where we're going to spend uh, the rest of the day today is talking about that. You don't so, want to go to that one. Yeah, no you don't. Um, so let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing. Lord, we do just present these scriptures before you and, and ask for your help with them, Lord, as you're the one who inspired this and wrote this in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't do us any good to try and figure it out with our own minds. Lord, we need the mind of Christ, and we thank you for that, Jesus, that that's the promise we have. So we ask you for that. We invite you here, Father, uh, to tabernacle with us, to be with us, to teach us and lead us in these scriptures, to open our hearts, our eyes, and our ears, to hear, see, and know what you have for us. In your name, Jesus, amen. amen. So the great white throne judgment is what we begin with, and you can take that around that way. Revelation? Yeah. Actually, let me show you this picture I captured. It's kind of a good picture that I thought I'd show of the great white throne judgment. And you can see on the left hand side um, the book that's open, the book of life, and on the right hand side are the then there were open books which we're going to talk about. And there's a poor soul down there about ready to face judgment at the great white throne. Chapter 20 starting with verse 11 now. And we're going to read verse 11 to the end. And it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were done written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now we get to tear this apart and talk about this. Um, which verses did you just read? That was verses 11 to the end of Revelation chapter 20. Starting with verse 11, the great white throne. Um, and it, it begins with, uh, with him who sat on it, from whose face earth and heaven fled away. Uh, which I, I found kind of interesting. If, we, if you think about that, okay, they're gone. Earth and heaven. Okay. Gone. Well, we know the old earth and heaven are gone. Yes. And the new yeah. has not yet been created, maybe. Correct. So this is the between time. <laughs> and it seems like in the between time when there is no heaven and earth, uh, except the third heaven, which is what Paul had visions of, which is heaven where, where God the Father occupies, that's still around, obviously. That's why this heaven is singular in form. I believe what this is referring to is the whole universe as we know it is gone. And I got a couple, I got a couple of scriptures that kind of point to that um, to help us understand that. But it seems that's what's going on here. Um, John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29 say, Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming, so Jesus is talking here in John chapter 5. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. 
those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So there are two resurrections, uh, one to life, one to death. But they will happen at different times. Yeah, <laughs> separated from, uh, well, actually all different times, because the Old Testament saints, then you got the New Testament Christians, then you got the tribulation believers, and then you got after the thousand years, everybody else. So you got all different times. Uh, Luke 10, 18 through 20 says this, And he said unto them, Jesus again is talking, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So Jesus, in talking about this book of life, says, hey, you know what? Yeah, the, the demons are subject to you, but that's not what is a matter of rejoicing. Um, it's a matter of rejoicing that your names are written in heaven. Remember when he told the people, he said, um, you've done all kinds of works in my name, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons and all this. But then Jesus says to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. Exactly. So don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you because they were to those people too who did not go to heaven. But instead, our rejoicing should be that our names are written in heaven. And that's by way of command. Jesus didn't suggest it. He said, rejoice. That's a command. Okay? So when's the last time you praise and thank God that your name is written in heaven because millions, perhaps billions of names are not. Remember, Jesus said, wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many are on it. Narrow is the way that leads to life, and only few are on it. So it is a matter of great rejoicing to know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So the question is, that, that leads us to this question, how do you get your name in there? By your deeds? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, sir. Yes, sir. By oh. grace. Yes, sir. Well, that's how, that's, that's how you utilize grace. Keep it I, I would suggest by grace your name gets in there, by your works it stays in there. <laughs> so, that's what I would suggest. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And that's the springboard. Now let's launch off of that into some other stuff. Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says, And you being dead in your trespasses, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your all, forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The question that this answers is, are your deeds nailed to the cross? All your past sins, everything you've done, are they nailed to the cross? And if they are, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. Lastly, I have from Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. And I think this is some of the verses we all have memorized. Paul writes that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So that's it. If, if you want to say deeds and works, that's the one thing you can do, and that's exercise your faith to believe in what Jesus did for you, and that will get you into heaven. It's when you put faith in him and him alone. Uh, faith will not get you into heaven. I could have faith in a stack of Bibles, and that won't get me to heaven. I could have faith in the coffee table, that won't get me to heaven. It's faith in Jesus. That's why it doesn't matter how much faith you have. It matters who your faith is in. If it's in Christ and his blood and his finished work, enough said. Because when you stand before Christ, um, it, if you want to say, gee, I, I mowed the pastor's yard and I washed his car 500 times and I said a thousand Hail Marys and whatever, okay, but... Whose faith, you know, did, did my son wash your sins away with his blood? Oh, he didn't? 
What kind of a relationship do you have with Yeah, exactly. Um, that was verse 9, verse 10 in Romans chapter 10, verse says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that has a period after it in my Bible. <laughs> Done. It's belief in Christ and his finished work. Because like I said at the place I just came, salvation is like God saying, I have one task for you to do, and that's pole vault over this bar. Okay? Well, the bar is set to like five miles high. And he says, oh, one more thing. You have no pole. But still, you need to get over that bar. And we, we say, we just can't do it. It is impossible for us. And he would say, exactly. And I don't want you to even try. Because your trying makes what I did for you of no effect. He says, I have someone who will carry you over. You don't have to limp. All you have to do is lay back and let the stretcher of Christ carry you over the bar. And he will do He's already done it for us. I'm really concerned about after I cleared the bar, what happens then? Um, you place your hands in, uh, you, you place yourself in his hands and he will carry you where you need to go. Remember, he's the one getting you over. He's not going to let you fall. <laughs> Good question, though. You caught me. Um, So, who are these characters? Um, it, it doesn't say the earth gave up their dead, which is strange. The earth is missing. Um, but it does say that um, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in it. This is very strange. It's very interesting. This is portion of scripture. Um, so first he says, everybody is there. But then he mentions two specific places where there have been people held or non-people held who are now going to experience their time of judgment. So I want to bring up Jude. What Jude said in Jude chapter 1 verse 6. Jude writes, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their abode... He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So there are angels who chose to follow Satan who perhaps these are the angels who, it says, left their habitation, who did not keep their proper domain, it says, um, who were the angels, the fallen angels, who procreated with the women back in Genesis and made those giants. Perhaps it's them who are being kept in this judgment. It doesn't say specifically, but Peter also alludes to it. And Peter writes in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Okay, so both Jude and Peter allude to these angels being held somewhere until judgment. And if you ask me, this is what sheds so much light on Genesis in the very beginning, um, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Okay? That's what the beginning of Genesis says. Isn't that interesting? How darkness was, you have one level here, darkness over the face of the deep. Okay? Darkness. Above that, you have these waters. Above that, you have the Holy Spirit kind of acting as a sentry over the earth, what's going on here. It, it makes perfect sense to me that this is when Satan fell and the angels who were held down there, uh, the, the Lord is over that. He's guarding that and uh, over those waters during that period of time. Um, it, it, to me, it just kind of opens that up. If Heavenly Father is anywhere, He is light. So, how could that be darkness? 
over the face of the deep. Um, if he's there, to me, that's also light. right. This is before uh, physical light was created. So spiritual light, yeah, he's everywhere. Um, in in the darkness, to me, this is those angels who fell. They're the ones who were covering the face of the deep. They are that darkness, the enemy, uh, who fell. That's where they were being held. Some of them still are being held, waiting for their judgment. And this is at this time in Revelation, I believe, this is where they're brought up to stand before the great white throne judgment. You know, it kind of makes sense. It's, it's bad enough to have rebelled against God and become essentially a demon. Mm. But if you did more than that, if you interfered with God's creation, human beings, that's another story. Yep. <laughs> Pat is asking what giants... Giants in Genesis, um, in was it four or five where it talks about Noah, where it says the angels of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and that's about after I quit watching that. Oh, what verse is that? Yeah. Chapter six of no, uh, of Noah. Chapter six of Genesis. <laughs> Genesis chapter six. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God. That's referring to what we believe to be those angels who fell. And what Jude and Peter are saying left their natural abode as angels, took on a human form, and procreated with these women. Um, verse two, chapter six in Genesis that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever, for he is indeed flesh. Um, and verse 4, it says, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So it's a result of that what we what's commonly believed among uh, the Christian faith is these fallen angels took on a human form, procreated with these women, and that's where we got the giants from. Um, it's a, it's a it was a mixed race, and uh, it's what one of the reasons why uh, God destroyed the flood. See, God promised back in Genesis that it was through Eve that the Messiah would come. Okay, and. Uh, Ever since then, the enemy was trying to destroy the human race. Totally contaminate. Exactly, to contaminate it. Um, and that's what he did. It was trying to contaminate it until there was like all that was left was Noah, basically. And Satan thought he had just about had it. Um, it was kind of like a, a big chess game in the universe and, and where the enemy makes one move. God's like, okay, I got that. What's next? Um, I'm glad that answers your question, but that's that's where we get that from. And I believe it's those characters, those demons, who are now brought up to face their judgment. Um, and we read in the end there uh, that this is the second death in that verse 14. You know, the interesting thing about this second death is the Bible has no reference to a resurrection or an escape or, or any way out of the second death. There's nothing. The second death is a continual eternal state of existence. Um, there's, there's no escaping it. So it says, to lake of fire, this is the second death. So it's either live once, die twice, or die once and live twice. The choice is yours. I choose to die once, and that would be in Christ, and live twice. So I believe the, a lot of this is um, what I've been able to put together from the different sources I collect. So I believe that at the end of the millennial reign, that all the people who were born will take part in this judgment. Okay, you're going to have a lot of people procreated during the millennial reign. It's a thousand years, okay? The earth is going to be hugely populated. 
some of those people will have expressed faith in Christ. Where's their judgment? Right here at the great white throne. The reason is, it says anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So to me that says there will be some or else I don't think that phrase would, would be there written like that where it says and anyone not found. So there will be a someone who has, who has expressed faith in Christ during the millennial reign who will receive eternal life. Um, this is where I believe Matthew 25 through 30, uh, 25, 31 through 46 fits in the grand plan because it is judgment based on works. Is that interesting? So works do play a part, and that's right here at the great white throne judgment. Um, this judgment is based on works. Um, so will these works save them? Well, so is ours. Not necessarily. Our judgment is based uh, for on rewards, works. yes. Everybody there will be there by grace, but what level you are That's is correct. going to be by what you did um, with what the Lord entrusted you. Um, and that's what can be very scary because <laughs> I'm worried about the bucket load of wood, hay, and stubble. <laughs> Am I going to be lighting up heaven with my lack of inser insincerity, my, my lack of sincerity at times? Um, so I don't think these works necessarily will bring about their salvation as that is only in Christ, but it will bring about the rewards. Mm -hmm. right. um, as with the people who are sentenced to the lake of fire, I also believe it will bring about the level of punishment. I believe that Satan himself is going to be experiencing the darkest, deepest, most horrific. And then there's going to be different levels because some people who rejected Christ, no, no doubt, who belong in hell, but maybe contributed to charities and stuff, maybe did some good deeds, but maybe don't qualify them to be as low as Hitler, Hitler Mussolini, or whoever else, Saddam Hussein. Saddam insane? Yeah, Saddam insane. Um, so darn insane. Um, Osama bin Laden, the people who are responsible for multiple millions of deaths, um, maybe they're right there at the level, or close to the level of Satan, I don't know. Um... Somewhere in the millennial reign, I believe people will have expressed faith in Jesus during this reign. And they will be rewarded for their works um, at this time. Whereas we are rewarded for our works at the Bema Seat. Okay, when we're raptured, we're out of here. That's when we have our time with Christ. And he um, lets us know, hey, you had wood, hay, and stubble. But you also had some gold, silver, and precious stones. You suffer loss, and maybe he'll show us what we could have been in him at that time and that will be the loss that we feel when we realize if we had dedicated ourselves and been sold out to Christ as Paul was what could we have accomplished in Christ if we had no reservation yeah, but I, I, I think to some degree we've all had reservation in our life and we have not gone all out and done everything we possibly could for Christ and so we're all going to be there with a little bit of a wood chip some hay some straw, and hopefully a boatload of gold, silver, and precious stones, you know? But anyway, so what is that judgment that I'm talking about in Matthew chapter 5? I'm sorry, 25? Matthew 25, 31 through 46 is the sheep and the goats. And I believe this is where the sheep and the goats comes into play, is at the great white throne. And having explained the great white throne judgment like that, see if this helps make sense of the sheep and the goats. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. See how this is not the Bema seat at all? This is not our judgment at all. This is a separate time and place. So what happens to the goats? They go into everlasting punishment. Immediately, or do they... Later. Well, at the end of this judgment, yeah, it, it's right there. When we get to the end of it, that's what he does. I have it underlined. Verse 33, And he said, And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. 
Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. All these conditions are very well quite possible in the millennial reign. As people, though they might not have Satan, they will have their own humanity and a choice to serve themselves selfishly or to help others. And I believe those who are living for Christ, even at that time without the devil's temptation, um, those who, you still can choose to do good or not. And there will still be need. Um, it will be a time, I think, of great pros prosperity, but you're still going to have people doing wrong and, and dying during that time. Uh, verse 37, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, this is Jesus, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Because there's going to be a boatload of Jews alive at that time, having been rescued from Petra. Okay? Those are his brethren. He's Jewish, you know. <laughs> um, yes. And so he, that's why he says, In as much as you've done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? One of the angels want to go get the Lord a Coke and a hamburger? Oh, you're not hungry? Yeah, I kind of lost my appetite, too. Or sick and in prison. Were you in prison, Lord? Uh, what were we in for anyway? Hello. Hello. And he did not minister and did not minister to you. When do we see you sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. My friends, to quote Keith Green, the only difference between the sheep and goats is what they did and didn't do. <laughs> that kind of covers it. <laughs> yep. So that's why I believe this doesn't apply to us, um, but it applies to those during the millennial reign who, who had that opportunity to do those things. We will all have already been judged. We will have already had our rewards. It would make sense for us to be there at that time. Second Peter, this is about the destruction of, this is kind of where, if I take this and put this together, where I, I'm convinced in my own thoughts that this applies to not only Earth and our atmosphere, all the universes we know it being destroyed. 2 Peter 3, 7 through 14. Check it out and see if you agree or not. But the heavens, this time it's plural. Plural. Peter says, but the heavens, which would encompass the first and second where the, the universe is, and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved... Do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away. With a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will burn, be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Question mark. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, 
look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Here's the answer to that question mark. Verse 14, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And it's interesting. Somehow, I don't think God needs self, but hmm. does God use this opportunity <clears throat> is a training ground for a lot of the saints to say, you're going to need to know how to do this. Watch. <laughs> how to destroy and recreate earths? Yeah, wow. <laughs> well, um, training ground or not, we will see it. We'll be a part of it. We'll be watching it, no doubt. Um, but that's kind of where I get the feeling that it's not just the physical earth, not just our, our earth here, but it's also the entire earth universe and hebrews even to me builds on that even more in hebrews 12 25 through 29 it says see that you do not refuse him who speaks for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then talking about back in exodus when god gave the ten commandments and he shook the earth this is what it's referring back to when it says, um, him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things, so the things which are made would encompass everything. Everything has been made in our physical universe. So it indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made. That the things which cannot be shaken, which are things that are not made or spiritual, may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And if I must interject a comment here by way of a rabbit trail or digression, the one thing we lack in the United States of America is those last phrases, a reverence and a fear of God. America these days, from the top on down, has lost her fear and reverence for God. The one who set this whole thing in motion in the first place, we cannot even imagine the billions of galaxies, each containing billions of stars out there in the universe. And there's a God who spun it all out in five words in Genesis. And the stars he made also. And that was it. That's the only reference we have to the creation of the whole universe. And how dare we, in our puniness, put ourselves above him in our own thinking and in the way we do things to say that the life in the womb is, is worthy of death? So we kill unborn children who are made in the image of this very God? Somebody's got some accounting to do for all this. Yes, ma'am. Do you think uh, one thing about the thunderstorms is that people should be fearful then, you know, acknowledge God because, uh, you know, some natural disaster type things you know, can really shake up somebody and uh, oh, yeah. make him think twice about who God really is. He's got all power, huh? The, yeah, they have had that effect. Earthquakes, hurricanes, all these natural disasters have had that effect. And I believe you're right. They should have that effect on us to kind of sober us up a little bit, kind of shake yeah. us at the shoulders and think, um, just to remind us whose earth this really is. <laughs> What's that phrase? There, are no, there are no atheists in foxholes? <laughs> yep. Yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. I hear what you're saying, and I guess I have no reason to doubt it. It's just that I'm thinking, why in the world does it make sense to destroy the vastness of the universe when we are the only problem essentially here on earth? Uh, that's a good question, I, and I think we are the reason it was created in the first place for us Whatever to enjoy. Um, I, I also believe um, it's under the, the curse of the fall 
the whole whole universe was placed under that when Adam sinned, really? not just Earth. Yeah, I believe that's why you have um, decay, even in the universe. It's not living in a perfect eternal state. It's decaying. You have stars that go supernova and explode, and uh, things happening out there. Uh, where if you left the universe to itself, right now it, it would all entropy down, wind down right. to nothing. Um, but not initially. It's in the correct. <laughs> I believe we will have a restored one later on. And that's in chapters 21 and 22, which we'll get into next week and the week after of Revelation. But right now, this is the winding down of the current state of things and its disappearance. And then, in the next couple chapters, it's grand reappearance. And I think the restored version, you know, universe 2.0, <laughs> is going to be wild. So, you know, we look at things out there in the universe and, and the, the nebulas and the clouds and the, the shapes they form, and we call it the horsehead nebula. Uh, we call it the sombrero galaxy because it's shaped like a sombrero. Uh, all these things out in the universe that are so wild and just blow our minds to see are nothing compared to what's going to be happening then. The lady in the back, yes. Do you think that maybe this could be stretched enough to say that one reason the rest of the universe is going to be destroyed is because maybe they did, there is or was life on other planets and they also fell? That would devalue us. Because we are unique in, in ourselves right now, in Earth being the only special place of God's creation. If there were other places out there, that would, that would make us less unique and devalue us. Um, I think, in my opinion, we are the apple of his eye. And this Earth, the one place where he chose to put his name, Jerusalem, raises the value of it and the stakes of it. No other place did he say that to or of. Scientists found other living creatures on other planets. Not yet. Mm -hmm. oh. They haven't even. They got building blocks, but that's it. They don't have life, which is kind of interesting because one they'll call one cell life, but here on Earth, um, <laughs> you put billions of cells together and call it the result of um, conception, and decide, oh, we can just dissolve this away, and uh, with the government's <laughs> approval, yeah, it's just tissue. Why are so many people? Uh, eager to all go together and uh, agree that yes, all of these horrible, horrendous things happening uh, are really no, no. Uh, how should I say? You might say created by man from glo uh, global warming. Mm -hmm. Well, now. Who created global warming? Who has the responsibility of it? We yeah. know that. Right. Global, yeah, global warming is another, I think, a complete farce. What, what, what? Yeah. Um, the earth has been heating up and cooling for thousands and thousands of years all by itself. You know, and we're, we're, we're suggesting. so hard to prove God wrong. Yeah, we're. It doesn't exist if they can spend that time into something new. Yeah, we're talking hundreds of degrees. Hundreds of degrees of sway in the heating and cooling of the earth. And we're trying to say that all this natural junk that's going on is the result of man raising it one tenth of a degree? Globally? Really? You know, my leg can only be pulled so far. Eventually, you stretch the truth, it's going to break. Anyway. I want to end this with something out of 1 Corinthians, and I think that this sums up the end of the judgment, and this is it. It's the final, the end of, of all the judgment that will ever be is right here. And so what happens when, when it's all done? Remember back in the Psalms, the Lord wrote, um, the Lord, David wrote, the Lord said to my Lord, sit down until I put your enemies under your feet, right? This is it, the fulfillment of it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28, and this is out of the Amplified Version. And I didn't notate that, so when you read it, when I give you the notes, it says Amp. That's out of the Amplified Version. It says, 
After that comes the end or completion, when he, Jesus, hands over the kingdom to God the Father. After he has made inoperative and abolished every ruler and every authority and power, for Christ must reign as king until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished and to be put to an end is death. For he, the Father, has put all things in subjection under his, Christ's, feet. But when he says all things have been put in subjection under Christ, it is clear that he, the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, Christ, is accepted since the Father is not in subjection to his own Son. However, when all things are subjected to him, Christ, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the One, the Father, who put all things under him, so that God may be all in all. The end. <laughs> Hasof. That would be the end in Hebrew. The end. It's over. So there you have the end. And in the next coming weeks, all we have is the new beginnings. A new earth. A new heaven. Uh, it's all made brand new. And it kind of, in that, drifts into eternity. Whereas the opposite was Genesis comes out of eternity and then focuses in creation. And, and just like the way it came in, it kind of drifts back out into eternity with the Lord. So I know it's kind of short this time, um, but that's, that's the end of that. And uh, next week we get all things made new. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Bye.